six more weeks of winter, or spring is around the corner. Now, what I've heard, I was just informed this morning that apparently Bill did not see his shadow, but I was a little crushed to hear he's only been right 38 times. So, but you know, come on, we're superstitious people, so we have to we have to believe that, right? That a rodent knows weather. Um, now, what's interesting is, did you know that Groundhog's Day has a connection to the church? And I'm not making that up. It's true. There's actually, this day is not only Groundhog's Day, it's also a special day in the church called... If I can get it to light. Called Candlemas. Candlemas. And I'm not making that up either. Um, it's a Christian <coughs> festival of lights. It was started hundreds of years ago. It commemorates the ritual <coughs> purification of Mary 40 days after the birth of Jesus. Also, 40 days after birth is when a infant was presented to the temple. And so Jesus was brought, according to tradition, 40 days after his birth, Jesus was brought to the temple in Jerusalem and presented as a child of God, as a member of that sect. And so it's really interesting to, to see how that connects. Now you're wondering, okay, yeah, they're on the same day, but are they still connected? Yes, Candlemas and Groundhog's Day are still even more connected. I'll continue. It was also the day to bless the candles used in the church. That's why it's called Candlemas. It was the festival day, or mass, of candles. And candles were, of course, important in the early church because, well, they didn't have electricity. So they had to have candles. So it was really important to have candles. And in fact, it was a tradition for there to be candles all around the, the uh, sanctuary, even now to this day, on this day, and the service would only be lit by candles. I'm not gonna do that to y'all because I have a feeling if I did that, we would have a fire somewhere. I would knock one over or something, or there'd be a mess made. But, so I figured one candle is enough for right now. But it was also considered that candles gave protection against plague and illness and famine. And of course, candles represented Jesus as the light of the world. Now, eventually, the idea of candles <coughs> was talking about predicting the weather, uh, the rest of winter coming into play and everything. And there are actually songs and poems and even special food you're supposed to prepare and eat to celebrate Candlemas. In, in all over the world, um, I actually found some, some French poems and everything. I'm never going to try to pronounce those at all, ever. But it was really kind of interesting. There's, there's all sorts of uh, proverbs and, and stories that go along with Candlemas. And it expresses the idea that a bright and sunny day meant more winter was to come, whereas a, a cloudy, wet, stormy day meant that winter wasn't over yet. And actually, the German people then added in the animal factor. In fact, there's, there's a little proverb here. The badger peeps out of his hole on Candlemas, and if he finds first snow, walks abroad. But if he sees the sun shining, he draws back into his hole. Apparently, it sounds a lot prettier in German. Um, <laughs> But the idea was that if a creature came out and saw their shadow, of course, we, we had uh, what, more winter, or winter, uh, sure. whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Phil's always wrong. Um, but anyways, the idea came <coughs> over to our country. And of course, uh, badgers aren't nearly as common here, so it was changed the groundhog, where the, the immigrants saw the more common animal. So we have this idea of candlemas, groundhog said. And in fact, uh, Punxsutawney Bill um, started, that whole tradition started in 1886. It's not the same groundhog. Um, but the idea was, you look at Bill or 
watch Phil, and if he comes out and talks to the, the presenters, they, they determine whether or not he saw his, his shadow. And so the question is, what, what is the idea? What is he, why does he go back in his hole? Um, what is he scared of? Well, he's scared of his shadow, is, is the traditional sense, that he's scared of his shadow, and that's why he runs and hides. It's a fear of his shadow. And it's sometimes the shadows in our own lives that scare us the most. Now, back in 1975, I don't remember this because I wasn't born yet, there was a little film that came out uh, presented by Mr. Steven Spielberg. Can anybody guess what movie that was? Cause what? No, it wasn't Star Wars. That was 1977. <laughs> So I'm cultured. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually a film about a great fear, and in fact brought oh. about a great fear. Jaws. Jaws. Oh. People became terrified of going into the water because of Jaws. In fact, there's a story that went um, that a man wrote an article that. Um, his wife had seen Psycho and was terrified of taking a shower and saw Jaws and was terrified of getting in the ocean. And he says, I can't get her near water anywhere. <laughs> but anyways, the idea was there's this great fear, a fear of shark attacks. But what's interesting is shark attacks are actually a really rare occurrence. It doesn't happen that often. You're in fact 30 times more likely to get hit by lightning than be attacked by sharks. But we have this irrational fear of sharks. What about arachnophobia? Step on <laughs> that, 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 big, that word, it's that big word and everybody knows it, right? The fear of spiders. We have an irrational fear of spiders and yet, beneficially, they're wonderful, aren't they? They take care of the insects, they take care of all these problems. That doesn't mean they don't freak us out. But they're beneficial, right? We have an irrational fear. Now here's one I can appreciate. Snakes. I don't like snakes. Um, I, I like to say, you know, the first form Satan came to man in was the form of a serpent, so I'm just being, playing it safe. Uh, but I don't like snakes. Snakes are something I don't like. There's Mostly, though, a zero chance of dying from snake bite, though. Fewer than 1 in 37,000 are bitten by snakes each year, and only 1 in 50 million people actually die from snake bites. You are nine times more likely to die from lightning strike than from a snake bite. So our fears, sometimes they... they exist, yes. And in our minds, they're rational. They make sense. But really, they're unfounded. We sometimes are like the groundhog. We're scared of our own shadows. And the fear can hinder us, can keep us from doing what God is calling us to do. Fear or phobias come in all sorts of different forms. We live on the edge of fear. We're constantly afraid of what's on the other side. Whatever's coming up next. We protect ourselves, and that's not a bad thing. But are we protecting ourselves because of a fear of what could happen? Are we protecting ourselves because it really will happen? And I think that's a, there's a big difference there. Well, I don't want to do that because, you know, there's a 37,000 percent chance I might deal with this. Well, Does that really make a lot of sense? Probably not. We have to worry about that, though. I guess worry is not a good word. We have to be careful of that. We have to be careful that our fears don't dictate our actions. Because honestly, if we let fear dictate our actions, we never leave the house. But then again, they also say that most accidents around, happen around the household. So there's another fear, right? We have to be careful 
that what we're doing isn't just because we're cowards. And maybe that sounds like a rough word, but isn't it? Isn't that real? Isn't that honest? Richard Rohr said, the greatest enemy of faith is not doubt. The greatest enemy of faith is fear. Most of the world is controlled by fear. Petty and big. Petty fears control people. Great fears control nations. We can feed all the people in this world if we would stop building arms, but we are afraid. Now, I, I don't know the, the numbers, but we've all heard about how um, this nation has enough nuclear weapons to wipe out the entire world 50 times over. And this country has enough to wipe it out 48 times over. Boy, they better build up their armaments, right? Does that make any sense whatsoever? Honestly and truly. I mean, I have no problem with having an effective and protective military. I don't have a problem with that. But what drives that is fear. Fear of being attacked. And we have to, we have to be rational and be protective. Don't get me wrong. But, but, did Jesus always call us to be safe? I mean, read scripture. Over and over again, we're called to not be safe, really. We're called to step out and trust. Ooh, now that's scary, isn't it? Trust? That's terrifying. Trust in something we cannot see. Trust in something that can move the world and we have no control. It's terrifying, isn't it? And especially in this nation, let's be completely and totally honest, we have become a nation dealing with the fear of xenophobia. Anybody know what that is? It's the fear of strangers. The fear of foreigners. Now again, I don't have a problem with us being protected. I don't have a problem with that at all. And yet, we're constantly putting protections around ourselves to not deal with those people. A, a couple weeks ago, uh, my dad and I went and saw a show, and then later on, uh, Christian and Laura went and saw it. It's the, the musical Come From Away. Now, I know not everybody's into musicals or anything, but I loved it. It was the one I've been looking forward to all year. It's the story that happened to happen on September 11th, 2001. This, uh, I'm sure you remember that part, right? So World Trade Centers were attacked, were brought down, right, uh, by planes. And what happened was all the planes that were in the air that were supposed to come to New York and actually over the entire United States were really diverted everywhere. And it, the story is about this little town in Newfoundland called Gander. Had approximately 9,000 people. They landed 38 planes and almost doubled the population of that little town. Now, if that town had approached those strangers with xenophobia, the fear of strangers, they would have been stuck on those planes for five days. And yet, that little town of Gander wouldn't let them pay for anything, wouldn't let them cook, wouldn't let them do anything because they wanted to provide. Everything they did. <clears throat> and remember, it's important to remember, all those people on the airplane, on those airplanes, 
did not speak English. There was people coming from literally all over the world. They could not speak the same language. And yet they welcomed them with open arms. Now, I am, please don't think this is a sermon about me telling you that we need to tear down walls or anything else. At least not the physical walls. What I am saying, though, is we need to tear down the walls between cultures, between people that are different from us. Because why do we put up those walls? Because we're scared. The unknown scares us. I mean, let's be honest. Honestly, one of the biggest fears, especially that little kids have, is the fear of the dark, right? Are they really scared of the dark, though? They're scared of what's in the dark. And I think that's our biggest fear, too. Is we're not so much scared of this or that, we're scared of the unknown. And I think that's our biggest problem, is that we don't know, we don't understand, we don't connect, because they're different. We need to be like Christ, who opened his arms up to anybody and everybody. He was willing to say, I don't, okay, well, it's Jesus, so he didn't know them. But even the disciples were sent out, and they didn't know everybody. They trusted completely and totally in Christ and did what he said. He said, go out, make disciples. You know that country that hates us and we have this great rivalry with and they'll probably, they could potentially kill you? Go to them. That's what he did. He told them to do that. And here's the crazy part they did. Any of you all terrified of doing something like that? I am. I'll be honest. Will I do it? If I get called to do it, I'll do it. I, I, may, I may be shaking the whole time, but I think I would be willing to do it. I had an opportunity to go to Haiti a number of years ago, and I've mentioned this before, but um, shortly before we got there, the UN had pulled out. There was really no protection for us. You ever had somebody run at you uh, carrying an AK-47? That's scary. That's scary, y'all. But I did it. I didn't move when I came running. I stayed right there. But we had that. We had people speaking a language we didn't know. <coughs> we had all these different things that could have been a barrier. And yet, we didn't let it be a barrier. We went forward, we moved forward. I'm not saying look at me, be just like me. No, be better than me. Be like Christ, that's who you should be like. Don't let fear dictate what he's calling you to do, because he's calling you to do something. He calls each one of us to do something. What's it gonna be? Are you gonna face your fears? Are you gonna slap them down and say, my God is bigger than any of my fears? Or are you gonna let fear dictate your life? You know, honestly, when we're in this country, we have it really pretty easy when we want to come to worship, don't we? We really do. I mean, you can literally go to church every single day and nobody give you any grief. Maybe your employer if you're missing work. But yet there's other countries, they literally risk their lives going to church gathering together as a body of faith. And so, I guess, I wonder sometimes, would we have that much faith? 
would we really be ready to risk our lives to go to church? Would we be really willing to face that fear? I guess that's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Only you can answer that. I can't answer it for you. But I think one of the reasons that we do or should face our fears in that is because of what Jesus Christ did. <coughs> you see, our Jesus not only presented an amazing meal, but an amazing sacrifice. A sacrifice <coughs> on the cross. Before that, he gathered together his disciples. These 12 oddballs, let's be honest, the disciples were oddballs. They were not the pick of the litter for uh, the religious leaders of the time. In fact, they were they were pretty rough. Most of them were probably illiterate. You know that, uh, well, Peter was kind of a drama queen. But yet, they stood strong in their faith. As an example, also an example to us. Christ our Lord invites to disable all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have we failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. <coughs> Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord and God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathe into us the breath of life when we turned away and our love failed. Your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, our and might, heaven and earth, On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to Father God Almighty, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, gave thanks to God the Father, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour
pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. One of the, the beautiful things about communion within the United Methodist Church is it's an open table. You don't have to be a member of this church or, or any church. All you have to do is have a desire to come closer to Christ. And I love that. You know, some people have talked about the fact that that's kind of scary, isn't it? Taking of the, the blood and the, the flesh of Christ. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? But if you're truly taking it in, it should be kind of intimidating. This is your commitment. You're saying, I'm willing to have a relationship. I'm willing to continue that relationship. I'm willing to be in relationship with Christ. So please consider that as we take communion. If I could have our ushers come forward. 